Good morning to everyone with us in person today and to those who are joining us virtually. And welcome to the 2022 EU-US Defense and Future Forum. As we meet here today, Russia is about to enter its fifth month of war in Ukraine. An unprovoked, brutal invasion intended to wipe Ukrainians and Ukraine off the map, but also to tear apart the international peace architecture. Now, if anything, this invasion has highlighted the indispensability of the transatlantic partnership in today's world. But this relationship doesn't just happen. You work on it. And this is why the delegation of the European Union to the United States and the Atlantic Council are bringing together leaders and stakeholders to develop a new transatlantic agenda and momentum for that indispensable partnership. I am so pleased to be joined this morning by my dear friend, Fred Kemp, the President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, so, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you to our in-person audience, our virtual audience. It has been a pleasure for us at the Atlantic Council to partner with the European Union delegation on this flagship forum that showcases the impressive breadth and depth of the transatlantic relationship. At last year's inaugural EU-US Future Forum, uh, we stood in a studio speaking to a virtual audience. This year, I'm thrilled that we are able to bring together an in-person audience here at the Hamilton Hotel and move slightly beyond the Zoom fatigue that I'm sure we have all felt, but we've held on to the exponential increase of our audience by keeping some of it virtual as well. Yeah, exactly. exactly, Fred. At the same time, the Atlantic Council's virtual capabilities indeed still allow us to bring together a truly transatlantic audience for these timely discussions. Also this year, dear friends, we are combining the second edition of the EU-US Future Forum with the EU's annual Defence Forum, now in its 11th year. The Defence Forum is more relevant than ever, given recent events in Europe, as well as the great strides that we have made with regard to Europe's evolution as a security actor and our dialogue with the United States in this important area. For us, at the Atlantic Council, the transatlantic relationship has been at the heart of our work since we launched this organization 60 years ago. It's part of our DNA. And we have doubled down on the transatlantic relationship and also on relations between the US and the European Union within it across our now 16 programs and centers. So we don't just look at Europe in the Europe Center, we look at it in the Africa Center, in the Middle East Center, in our Geotech Center, Geoeconomic Center. We're working with our European partners across all of our 16 programs and centers. Uh, and, uh, and we and our Europe Center team has worked tirelessly to organize this forum with our EU delegation colleagues. Now, I want to say one thing, and that is we are deeply connected in Europe. We're not just a U.S. organization doing Europe. We are a transatlantic organization, illustrated by the election sat uh, on Sunday of our Europe Center senior director to the French Parliament. He won in the 16th district of Paris with Macron's party, uh, and it was just a great showing by Ben Haddad. And so the acting director of our Europe Center, Jörn Fleck, who is German, by the way, also underscores the depth of connection uh, with a, a very, uh, a staff from many different countries, and of course, the United States itself. Ambassador Lambrinidis, it was a treat to host the Future Forum with you last year. And we're thrilled to host this year's combined EU-US Defense and Future Forum with you and your remarkable team. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the same goes for us, of course. Uh, in 2021, we convened the EU-US Future Forum, as you mentioned, as the first major gathering of American and European leaders following the inauguration of a new US administration. We wanted to focus on the resetting and renewing of the transatlantic agenda. It was also, at the time, a celebration of the 70th anniversary of the EU's earliest beginnings with the creation of Europe's coal and steel community back in 1951. Now, just a year after our inaugural forum, few could have imagined, few could have imagined the situation that we are in today. War has once again come to Europe with Mr. Putin's unprovoked aggression against an independent free people, the people of Ukraine. With his naked, anachronistic war, Vladimir Putin has challenged not just the sovereignty of Ukraine, but the entire security architecture that Europe and the United States together with countries all over the world set up after World War II. One, based on sovereignty, on self-determination, on the rule of law, 
on respect of borders, human rights and dignity, democracy and peace. These are not obsolete concepts. They are concepts that Mr. Putin wants to make obsolete. This will not pass. Indeed, Mr. Ambassador, this is a critical moment for European security. I would actually say for the world at large. It's an inflection point for the transatlantic relationship. As important as the periods after World War I, World War II, and the Cold War, it looks like a moment of tragedy for the people of Ukraine in many respects, but in other respects, it's an opportunity. Because if Ukraine survives, if Ukraine wins, it is an independent, sovereign, uh, integral part of the, of, the, of, of the larger transatlantic community. If I were to sum up, uh, 2021 was defined by our renewal, the transatlantic relationship coming back together in a very strong way. This year will be defined by our response, our joint response to Vladimir Putin's attack on the liberal world order with vicious and unprovoked violence. And so far, our shared response has been nothing short of remarkable. Uh, the transatlantic relationship has seldom been stronger, if ever. As the world watches Putin's war in Ukraine in horror, I'm encouraged by our unity in supporting the Ukrainian people and in responding to Russia's brutality. The United States, the European Union, its 27 member states, as well as other key partners, both in Europe and around the world, are, are hanging together, all while Mr. Putin stands as a pariah on the global stage. The invasion has achieved the opposite of what Putin aimed to accomplish. Instead of splintering the West, NATO remains stronger, more united than ever, with two new applicant countries ready to join. This is the unmistakable lesson of this tragedy. A stronger transatlantic relationship, and amid this upheaval, our bond has proven to be more resilient than the will of dictators. But, and there's a big but here, is we're not done. We can't show fatigue. We've got economic distress, we've got inflation, but this is a time where we have to stay unified and the situation on the ground in Ukraine underscores that as good as we've been, it's not yet enough. Uh, and so that's part of what we'll be discussing today. Indeed, Mr. President, we cannot show fatigue. Mr. Putin would love us to. And there are many, many countries, many hundreds around the world who are looking at this war as well. And we have to look at them too. This is, dear friends, not a fight of the West against Russia. We must be very careful when we talk to the rest of the world about this war. This is a fight of the West, of the East, of the North, and of the South for Ukraine, and in defense of the United Nations Charter and of the universal international values that we all hold dear. We do not, at the same time, sit back while Russia conducts war crimes with attacks on civilians, hospitals, and schools. And we have been in constant, 24-7, contact with our U.S. partners to align our response to Russia's invasion. Our sanctions have targeted and frozen the assets of thousands of Russian oligarchs and others, and entities, Russian entities, that directly aid the Russian war machine. Russian banks, no longer have access to the SWIFT network. Russian planes are no longer welcome in European and U.S. airspace, isolating Russia from the rest of the world. Russia's central bank no longer has access to half of its reserves. Our member states have taken the extraordinary steps to ban Russian oil imports, dealing a major blow to Russia's backwards-looking economy for years to come, even though we rely to a very large percentage of those imports from Russia. And the European Union has taken unprecedented steps to provide lethal military aid to Ukraine, first time in our history, as part of our security assistance while sheltering millions of Ukrainians and others fleeing Putin's violence. Indeed, let's not forget how large numbers of Europeans and Americans, average citizens, have stepped up to organize help, supplies, medical relief, shelter, evacuations, and much more for the people across Ukraine and the millions of refugees across the European continent. 
at a political level, you know better than most of us, Mr. Ambassador, how united and coordinated American and European officials have been in our response to Russia's war. The United States is a key partner in supporting Europe in addressing energy security challenges, for example, including with the announcement of a deal to supply 50 billion cubic meters of US LNG every year until 2030. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, who, as you know, Mr. Ambassador, we gave her our highest honor last November, uh, the Atlantic Council's Distinguished Leadership Award, International Leadership Award. Uh, President von der Leyen has said that this will already replace one third of Russian gas heading to Europe. We were able to respond in lockstep and lightning speed uh, because we were already working together. The Trade and Technology Council, for example, had been launched to tackle critical issues like technology standards, supply chains, and increasing US and EU security and prosperity. It became overnight a clearing hub for high-tech export controls uh, and sanctions coordination following the Russian invasion. It is at the intersection of our trade, uh, our economic security, technology, and diplomatic cooperation that our efforts are most powerful, at the intersection of all these pieces. Simply put, we are stronger together, and this crisis has proven that point. Our joint response unity and resilience should give us hope that the transatlantic uh, partnership is not a relic of the past, but really it will shape the future. Ukraine must win, and I'm confident that we will emerge from this crisis stronger than ever with a Ukraine that is squarely situated inside a Europe whole and free, where eventually, hopefully, Russia finds its rightful and peaceful place. But first, Putin needs to end his war. Uh, and Ukraine has to stand as an intact, sovereign, democratic uh, country able to choose its own way in the world. And as a country, Fred, with a clear European future. Let us not forget that the European Commission just issued its opinion recommending EU candidate status for Ukraine and also for Moldova. The European Council the leaders of the 27 European Union member states will meet this week to give its decision on this important question. Ukrainians, dear friends, today are fighting and in many instances dying to defend European values. We want them to join us in the future in enjoying together the European dream of peace and prosperity. Now, as we move forward together, we of course have to mitigate the worst structural damages that Putin and other authoritarians are cause, causing to the global order. But lest we forget, these are not the only challenges facing us and the world. These are not the only challenges that will require transatlantic European and American leadership. Americans and Europeans are called upon to work together on everything from energy and food security, a big crisis today, to ensuring sustainable development and a global level playing field for trade and investment, to addressing the existential challenges posed by climate change while bringing forth at the same time new security and prosperity for all, to promoting and protecting liberty, human dignity and rights within our own borders and around the world. And this also translates and comes into dealing with new technologies taken over, artificial intelligence. Who sets the standards for those technologies? Who makes sure they're going to be used in human-centric ways in order to support democracy and human dignity and not to repress and trample on it? And to address these and other challenges today across the entire EU-US relationship, we have an action-packed forum for you today. And we'll be working these issues, not just at this forum, but throughout the year. So the forum is a, a, a goalpost. But between yeah. that, there's an open field, and we're going to be doing our work all, all along the year. Joining us are dozens of EU experts from the European Commission, the European External Action Service, and European Union member states. And from Washington, we are joined by US officials, including from the State Department, Defense Department, Commerce Department, and National Security Council, the Deputy National Security Advisor, John Feiner, will be with us later in the day to explore the most important elements of the EU-US relationship. For the first half of today, 
we'll unpack core issues of the transatlantic relationship, including food security, digital policy, economic cooperation, energy security, and the green transition. After lunch, we will turn to the hard security and geopolitical challenges that we are addressing together. We'll hear from our speakers about the future of EU, US, and NATO cooperation. We'll hear about European security, Europe's security role beyond its borders, transatlantic cooperation for prosperity and peace in the Indo-Pacific, and tackling hybrid threats. And last but not least, to close this year's forum, we will hear from Vice President of the European Commission, Vera Jourova, on our response to disinformation in the digital age. And that's a speech you won't want to miss. Indeed, today promises to be a series of stellar discussions from start to finish. And I encourage everyone to follow along in person and online via Zoom or social media. And make sure to join the conversation using the hashtag EUDFF22. I'll repeat this, EUDFF22. For our virtual audience, make sure to submit questions for our speakers. For those joining us in person, we will be ready to call on you for questions. Can I just say, by the way, Fred, I knew we were doing this in person, but I never expected that at 8 in the morning here in Washington we would get this fantastic room with so many people actually here. And it's great to see that it's not just us two who are looking to the beyond Zoom yeah. era, but everyone else. Okay, um, guys, the complete agenda with live stream, uh, detailed speaker information, and the latest announcements is available at AtlanticCouncil.org. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We may want to take this show on the road, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, <laughs> but thank you again for joining us with that. Uh, it's time to turn to our first discussion, a keynote conversation between U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman and Secretary General of the European External Action Service Stefano Sanino, moderated by Nick Schifrin from PBS NewsHour. What a great way to kick off the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.